You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. All right, everybody. That music means it is Interview Tuesday yet again here on the Options Insider Radio Network. It's time for our Options Insider Radio program, the interview program here. On the network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the aforementioned network. Reminding you, if you like what you hear, not just for this program, but for everything we do here throughout the week, multiple shows hitting you pretty much every day out there. If you like what you get, and make sure you leave those reviews on your platform of choice. More important than ever. In these crazy times, the network's obviously been running for a long time, but there's quite a few new people discovering the world of options these days. If you want to help point them to our door, be the beacon, the lighthouse that points the way to the network. Leave those reviews on your platform of choice. Leave those questions, too, including perhaps you have a suggestion for a guest you'd like to hear featured on the Options Insider radio program. Hit us up. We do love to hear from you guys. Let's see who we're hearing from today. We are joined by a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network, he is CC Lagator, the co-founder over there at Options AI. CC, welcome to the Options Insider Radio Program. Hey, Mark, thanks for having me. Fan of the show. Well, we're glad to have you on. And CC, if you're a fan of the show, we know what we're going to do next. We need to know for our audience out there, give them a little bit of an overview of some of your background in the options market as well as. What the heck is Options AI, sir? Sure. Yeah. So I, you know, I come from the dark side of the business. I was an options market maker and specialist. I won't hold that against you at all, sir. (laughs) Exactly. Um, You know, did that for some years. Um, You know, after that, I got into, you know, sort of on the educational and writing side online and, you know, was working with some fellows on um, CNBC. And, you know, got to see the, you know, the business and the industry from, you know, another set of eyeballs, which was really interesting and really informative. And, you know, I think what that did is, you know, like when you're on the market making side, I mean, it's, it's a, it's millions and millions of trades happening over time. And, you know, the way market makers make money is, you know, they're obviously taking volatility positions over time and all but you know a lot of it is just the little bits of edge on every trade and you're you know you're just constantly hitting every strike and you know across 250 stocks and it's a really different you know view of the market than when you flip over the retail side and you know somebody might just have they want to do an options trade in some stock they really like or they might be you know sort of puzzle solving a little bit and wanting to learn more about how, you know, options work. And, you know, they start doing more and more trades, but, you know, it never, it never gets to the point of what it looks like from the market making side. And, you know, from when we set out, uh, you know, two years ago to start Options AI, it was really with, you know, a lot of that experience in mind, which is, you know, how do you, from a retail perspective of how options are actually traded 
Um, you know, a lot of these products are built from my side of the business and it, therefore they end up, you know, extremely complex, something that I would find useful, but a lot of people, you know, out there with, you know, their retail brokerage accounts, you know, it can be a bit overwhelming and it's very, um, you know, it doesn't exactly inspire confidence a lot of times when you're staring at all those numbers and all those Greeks. And that's sort of what led us um, and guided us in the development of Options AI, which, you know, we just launched this summer, which was interesting timing. Yeah, walk us through that really quickly, because obviously this has been a tumultuous year from just about every description you could possibly imagine. One of the perhaps unanticipated, certainly unexpected developments we saw coming from the pandemic and everyone being stuck at home is just an explosion of retail trading. So on one hand, perhaps maybe the best year ever to launch a new options brokerage. On the other hand, extreme volatility, extreme madness in the markets. Not a lot of time to really dot all your I's and cross all your T's before the madness overwhelms. We saw it overwhelm some much larger and more established brokerage firms many times throughout the year. So on the flip side, it could be perhaps the worst year to launch a new options brokerage firm. So maybe walk us through that process. What was that like launching into the tsunami of trading that was 2020? I mean, absolutely mind-boggling, right? So we we were ready to roll out in about March. <laughs> and our first, um, you know, our plan was, all right, well, let's bring in some, you know, friendlies to open up the first, you know, accounts and, you know, fam, you know, friends and family, and then some people that had, you know, was starting, you know, to hit the beginning of our waiting list and having like a real personal relationship with those people, you know, real constant contact, see how things were going. And literally, it was right when, you know, the COVID sell off started. From a stress testing of our systems, it was incredible because we were like, I don't, you know, after the first three weeks, I was like, what haven't we seen? <laughs> you know, so that was an amazing, um, you know, like experience just because I don't think we could have stress tested in any way. We would have had to, you know, maybe we would have had to wait a year to, to hit that kind of stress test level. You now that has to be a little bit reassuring because you go through all these imaginary stress test scenarios and now just in the year that is 2020, you've kind of seen and done it all already. It's got to, got to be a little bit of a feather in your cap there, CC. Exactly. And what we found is, you know, Taking a step back to, you know, the way Options AI work, works is we are really, um, you know, most of our system is uh, multi-leg options, right? And wh what we discovered is, um, you know, and especially, you know, going back to what you were saying with the explosion in retail order flow and options over the summer is, you know, a lot of that order flow is still single leg, out of the money options, things like that. Very simple from a system standpoint. What we found was, you know, with multi-leg options is we were, you know, sort of forging a path in a lot of ways with a lot of these systems and what's going on, you know, as these orders travel through to the exchanges and to clearing firms and things like that. So, you know, and I don't think we would have had the same experience if it had just been, you know, a VIX at 16 all summer experience. Well, we've got so excited with talking about the madness that is 2020. We kind of put the cart before the horse. But let's get into that a little bit. Uh, options AI. You talk about kind of taking a different approach, a, a simpler approach to options trading. This is obviously not the first time that has been attempted. A few names like Trading Block and others leap to mind as, as brokers that have looked at the options landscape and said, you know, this thing is a little bit opaque, a little bit perhaps intimidating to newcomers who are primarily weaned on stocks that just go up or down. Now you're adding, as you mentioned, all the Greeks and volatility and all these other things to the mix. And it could be a little bit overwhelming. So maybe taking a little bit more intuitive approach could help. So not the first time this has been tried. What made you guys think that now was the time the market was ripe for yet another tilt at this windmill here, CC? Yeah, well, when we started with the concepts, it was really, you know, we felt like it was time for, you know, somebody to rethink the entire experience. And and what what's happened before is, you know, a lot of people still are, you know, everything is still going through an options chain. And we were like, well, what if we got rid of the options chain entirely? And 
what that led to was sort of a rethinking of the entire user experience. And that was what we quickly centered on early on was, you know, what if we, could we do this as a chart-based experience? And what would that chart-based experience look like? And what we quickly, you know, set upon was that the expected move, which I think a lot of people, you know, if you're, if you're used to trading options, you hear that term thrown around a lot. Um, you can see it within a chain on a lot of systems. Um, but what we did is we really made that the center of the experience. And it said, and essentially, if you could look at a chart, a historical chart, and then you could see the expected move from the options market drawn out on the same XY axis, you are suddenly looking at the chain in a completely different way out over time. And when you're going to make a trade, you know, whether it's an equity trade or an options trade, you should be starting from that basis and seeing what the crowd is essentially pricing in options and pricing in that stock. And then from there, if you are doing a price target out into the future, either on your own or with the crowd, you will then be a, you will be setting, you'll be nudged to slightly more, you know, possibly more realistic views. You know, you could see on this chart, like I think, you know, Tesla's going to go to 800 by year end. And it's like, well, you might be the only person that thinks that. You can tell that from this chart. Um, you know, but once you've started on that, you can basically, from a strike selection standpoint, which I think is what trips a lot of people up within options, um, you, you are now seeing the strikes through the eye of this chart of the future. And you're saying, well, the expected move is, you know, $10 higher in the stock for the next month. Why would I ever buy an option, um, you know, $15 higher from here? And, you know, like it starts to, you know, the, the outcomes of these trades, is, it really changes through these nudges, through the user experience. Now, obviously, the name is Options AI, so people are going to see that and probably make certain assumptions. Maybe they might think they come to your firm and they give you a bunch of money, then a robot runs amok and starts trading for them here, uh, CC. So, so where does the AI component come in? Well, there's a couple of ways, and part of this is, you know, we're, we are new, and what we're going to do is this platform is going to continue to evolve. And one of the things that, you know, we really see is, there is a automated trading aspect possibility to this in that, you know, especially around existing stock holdings where we feel like we can move in that direction of, you know, sort of you setting, you know, for instance, if you were long a Tesla stock and you're like, my strategy is to never sell Tesla. But at the same time, I know what Tesla can do. It can go down 50% in the blink of an eye and I don't want to have to make bad decisions if that happens. Um, what you, you know, what we could do on at options AI in the future, and this is something we're working on right now is, you know, you could set up a earnings month. It's going to protect on earnings months or, you know, with their, um, you know, car delivery numbers months and things like that. And then over time that hedges, those hedges can be paid for with, you know, some yield enhancement strategies over time. And that can be set up against the expected move and say, like, you know, I always want to do this 10% out of the expected move. And what that does is it allows the system, you know, you don't have to think about, I want to do it this volatility level. I want, you know, what happens if volatility is really low? It's all doing it for you because the market's doing the, that pricing before you get there. And it can sort of be, you know, guessing and assisting in your automated trades. Um, currently, what that, you know, looks like is, what we are doing is taking that options chain and distilling it for you. And, you know, those, those types of, um, you know, you can do any trade you want, but you start with this, you know, ex expected move um, centering point, which I think is extremely useful. And it gives people, you know, I think one of the things with the options, you know, with options in general, and this, this goes from, me with, you know, tons of experience all the way down to, you know, somebody just getting into this is, you know, those moments of um, where you really need confidence and you really need to feel that confidence. And, um, you know, I have that experience. If I'm putting together an options trade on a chain, you know, that last second check right before you hit submit is, you know, a little terrifying. You're like, wait, did I, did I make sure I'm selling that upside call <laughs> against this? 
Um, you know, and that kind of uh, all again, it goes back to all of those nudges create, you know, that you know sense of confidence when trading multi-leg options. And what we see ourselves as is this space in between, um, you know, for you know people looking for something simple, um, which is a word that gets overused. Um, you know, to sort of graduate into, you know, multi-leg options, options, you know, trade structures with better outcomes than, you know, just buying an upside call, for instance, or people that are, you know, just are looking to save time and making their life a little bit easier and saying, you know, I want to, in three clicks, I want to put on an iron condor in this stock before earnings. And, you know, we allow that and you can do it with the confidence of knowing that, you're not getting into something you don't understand and you're not getting into something that, you know, you might have messed up. So anyone who's nervous, they can rest assured that it's still self-directed trading. The AI is kind of just an added layer on the top, a layer of automation to help assist rather than taking hold of your money and running amok there, CC. Yes, exactly. And as, you know, it, with all online brokerages, um, you know, this is not something, these aren't, suggested trades. These are trades based on very strict criteria, which is your price target, the crowd's expectations, things like that, that are, um, you know, dynamic from the market and from you. Well, you kind of touched on it earlier, but it seems like another way you guys are, are trying to set yourself apart from the crowd is coming in and not just focusing on what we're seeing a lot of people doing right now, quite frankly, which are these single leg outright trades. You know, a lot of people talking about the Robin Hood wave of trading, all these one lots pouring into the options market and 90 odd percent of them are buying calls and Apple and Tesla and everything else like that. You guys are taking a little bit different approach and focusing, I wouldn't say exclusively, because obviously you can do outrights if you want, but focusing primarily uh, on spreads. Is that the case, CC? That's exactly right. And, you know, I, I think it's, Going back to the first, you know, question we were talking about is, you know, you have this wave of new traders moving into the option space. And, you know, obviously they've been enticed with, you know, free trading and things like that. But, you know, what, what comes next? What comes next after all of those, you know, 15 Delta calls expire worthless? And, you know, we see that as like, you know, who's who's going to be positioned for this next wave in options trading? The people that are sticking around, you know, that suffer through that first, you know, 20% sell off and, you know, are like, okay, I can use options in more ways than just, you know, reaching for this lottery ticket. And that's where we want to position ourselves. You know, since we're talking about this retail wave, it's kind of been an interesting and surprisingly controversial trend. I just had Jack Schwager on this program last week. He's, of course, the the creator of that seminal Markets Wizard series, and he's devoted a lot of his time to what he terms democratizing the market. And when I asked him about this retail wave, he thought it could be potentially a disaster. He wasn't a fan of it at all. Now, obviously, in one hand, it's a potentially large source of clients for you guys. So I'm sure you're intrigued from that perspective. But dialing it back a little bit, looking at it from a more of a, a 10,000 foot and health of the options market perspective, what are your thoughts on this you know, effectively tsunami of beginning one lot traders just diving headlong into the options market without much real knowledge of the product or indeed risk management? Yeah, and I cynical um, might be the right word. And, and there's sort of a, you know, um, that it runs through the DNA of what we've built, which is you are not able to get into undefined risk trades on options AI. It's completely defined risk. It is, you know, obviously calls and puts, and then it's call spreads. It's, um, or I should say it's debit spreads, it's credit spreads, it's condors, it's iron condors, it's iron flies. All the trades that you really would need for the majority of the audience. Um, and I think one of the big components of options trading is, you know, there, well, there's two, I should say. The one is what we're talking about, which is that buying that 15 Delta lottery ticket, right? Like we know how that ends. It works, it works, it works until it doesn't. Um, the other thing, which is, I think is even more, um, troubling to me is this idea in options that people could get into trades that they, you know, th there's stories of all, all of a sudden my account has flashed a, you know, a loss of $80,000. 
on a trade that I thought I only had risk of a thousand dollars. And of course, you know, you and I know that's probably an error. It's probably a really weird marker. It's a really weird early assignment thing that hasn't changed the nature of the risk of that trade. You and I know that, but the person on the other end doesn't know that. And I think it's really key to know, you know, I think that some of those horror stories we hear are that the people think it is possible. It is possible to lose, you know, they've read, they've heard that you can like lose your house in options. And by, you know, sort of taking, you know, a view that there's only, the average person only needs a certain amount of trades. And one of them, you can do the, listen, you can go on options AI and you can buy those 15 del- Delta out of the money calls all you want. But you are going to see that it is, you know, the way it is presented is, you know, you could do that same type of price target with a debit call spread. And you are, you have now just lowered your break even $15. You've, you've made your view completely realistic as, you know, compared to that lottery ticket. And over time, you know, that, that, the value to that person is that this is, you know, they're sticking around longer. They're, they're having, you know, obviously nobody can say that you're going to make money in options like all the time or over time or any time, but it shouldn't be something that's terrifying and it shouldn't be something that, you know, is like going down to the gas station and buying a lot of tickets. It should be neither of those things. Yeah, certainly a lot of lottery tickets going up right now in the world of options. You know, one of your co-founders reached out to us early on about getting on the show and he he, he mentioned an interesting trend. He said that the the market and the options world in general seems to have been somewhat fixated on this race towards zero commissions. And that's distracted people from what he termed the bigger issue out there, which is trade quality. What did he mean by that, CeCe? Yeah, I mean, we have this saying, um, mostly internally, I, we, we, we believe it should be simple to get to the smartest trade, not just any trade. And what we mean by smartest is, you know, the access to the options market in general has clearly, you know, the barriers have fallen. Um, it's very easy to set up an account. It's very easy to get, you know, a level one or a level two options trading account and just dive right in, right? And, um, you know, and there's, there's, you know, some of the, the you know, nice o- online brokerages have great education and all around it, but, you know, let's be realistic. How many of those people are that are diving right in or diving into the education, you know, like, for instance, on shows like yours. Um, so, you know, that, that race to zero in pricing is, you know, does that really matter that you're saving $7 in the trade when, you know, you're doing a trade that you might lose $600 on? And so what we did is we really focused on, you know, by smarter trade, we don't mean that it's going to work. We mean that, you know, you're, it's expressing your view the way you wanted it more properly. And I think that's where a lot of these people going back to those, you know, out of the money lottery tickets, you know, people are, they're seeing the, they're seeing the possibilities of that, you know, 50 cent upside call. And, but the, but the, you know, we know how that plays out in real life. Um, It could work, but it's not going to work over time. Now, looking at your, your site there for options, AI, people have a certain perception when they think of an options brokerage firm. A lot of them probably still think maybe to this day of a kind of a big, beefy, desktop-oriented experience. And you guys clearly, from the imagery you guys are putting up there on the website, seem to be taking a mobile-first approach. All the imagery, all the graphs, all the charting are shown on a mobile device out there. Is that the mindset going forward? Are you gearing this around that primarily mobile end user? Maybe not that mobile right now. Maybe they're using desktop right now. But eventually, when we all start going places again, primarily fixated and focused around the mobile device, is that how the platform was envisioned, CC? Yes. And it's interesting you mentioned the with the stay at home, you know, we've probably seen at least a 50% split on desktop. And so, you know, we designed for mobile. I mean, that's where this the business seems to be going. Um, but, you know, you can use this on desktop. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to, you know, sort of figure out like, you know, on the desktop experience, you know, what extra um, elements do you see? Or can can they be exactly the same on both? It's what So what we have right now is exactly the same on both, just with a different view, you know, the desktop version is wider. Um, but from an experience, yeah, it, it'll feel totally different to, you know, anything you've seen before, if you 
you know, open up an account or go on and, um, you know, see some of the videos because it is literally a chart based, um, you know, three button, um, you know, I want to do a neutral trade. I want to do a bullish trade. I want to do a bearish trade. And then seeing the comparison of, you know, here's a debit call spread. Here's a credit put spread. Um, here's a call, you know, compare them straight up and, you know, decide which one's, uh, you know, the best for what you're looking for. And then, you know, obviously you can edit the strikes and, and things like that. But yeah, it is a very different experience. And, you know, again, going back to that, you know, feeling that confidence, feeling that confidence. Um, you know, I'm doing, we, we have, uh, you know, I want to say we're in the teens as a percentage of the amount of, um, people doing, you know, about the orders that are iron condors and iron flies and things like that. So, you know, for people to feel the confidence, I mean, it's just fun, um, you know, doing trades like that and, you know, knowing that I'm risking, uh, you know, I'm risking 40, I'm risking $60 to make $40 a week and a half out on an iron condor. I mean, that's, that's fun trading. <laughs> fun trading. I like that. You know, speaking of fun, it might be, some people's idea of fun, I suppose, to dive into the options waters. Maybe not. You know, back in the early days of the early wave of options brokerage firms, you know, your options expresses, your tosses and all that stuff. It was novel. It was new. Of course, those have all now been acquired by monstrous leviathans. In fact, Schwab pretty much owns half of the space now. So when you're diving in this next wave of options oriented brokerage firms, you're now competing with a, a landscape that is just littered with leviathans who have big money, big dollars to spend going out there and doing things like acquiring customers and providing you know, educational support and customer support and tweaking their platform and all the other things that people have come to expect now from a, a cutting edge, a top tier options brokerage firm. So for you guys, as kind of the scrappy new addition, the scrappy upstart, you know, how, how daunting is that? Or perhaps is that maybe an area of opportunity you see out there, maybe somehow dodging between the leviathans yeah it, it, well that last word you just said is exactly right so what we've found is that a lot of people have multiple brokerage accounts and you know what we're seeing on our end is you know people have a you know one of the big established brokerages and you know they've tried some of the the free simple mobile apps you know, and they're looking for something in between. They're looking for something that, um, you know, they can get to, you know, more sophisticated trades. They can do it with ease. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, like they, they, it's not like they're forever going to leave those other brokerage platforms. There's a lot of stuff you can do on those that you can't do on options AI. And we're fine with that. And, um, you know, like what we see ourselves as is, you know, I have an account, I have, you know, my investments, I have my mutual funds, I have my, you know, sort of trading. What we started out with is saying, like, we want to be the place you think of, like, when you're going to do an options trade, like, why wouldn't you, you know, open up the options AI, AI uh, app and do it there? It's just easier. And it's, you know, hopefully better. It's an interesting point. You know, we don't talk about that enough. You're right. A lot of people have multiple brokerage accounts, one for maybe their 401k and that sort of thing, maybe one for their more, shall we say, aggressive type trading, maybe one siloed off just for their options trading. So that certainly does offer some opportunity out there. Speaking of opportunity, as I mentioned, the landscape kind of littered by Leviathans right now. There have been a few new additions, a few new upstarts joining the ranks outside of options AI. A few of them have confided to me off the air that one of the reasons, and maybe the primary reason they've dived into this space is all that first wave of entrants, they've all been acquired. They're all gone. So there is no one really to acquire if you want to come into the option space now and pick someone up. So they're throwing their hat into the ring pretty much specifically because they want to be the next one to be acquired. Is that lurking in the back of the mind over there at Options AI there, CC? Do you guys want to be the next one picked up by one of these giant options or traditional financial firms? I'm going to say something crazy. We think we can make money doing this. And we think we can uh, become a profitable ongoing business with um, you know the types of accounts that we're seeing. And you know, down the road, you know, maybe that becomes um, something. But, you know, right now, I feel like we would be buried. Um, if somebody big 
took us. I mean, we'd be buried somewhere within their system. Like we're, we're the only thing out there that I'm aware of that centered an entire options experience without an options chain. And that makes us really unique. And we see a massive opportunity to go it alone for at least a while. Speaking of going alone, in the early days when you're first getting this thing up and running, you obviously have to get a little bit of outside capital to get the wheels turning out there. How challenging was that in the early days when you're out there pitching it? I'm assuming this was pre-pandemic when you're out there pitching all of this. How how difficult was it to get people to come on board and say, hey, yeah, you're right, there is an opportunity in that option space? Or maybe was it the flip side that looked at the the landscape that I just described and said, you know what, that's way too blood red. There's too many big, deep pocketed established competitors that we don't want to go anywhere near there. How difficult was that process? You just said everything perfectly. So we were very lucky. We, you know, one of my co-founders um, has, you know, so my background, obviously I mentioned I'm from the market making space. One of my co-founders um, is from the institutional brokerage space and options. And we were very lucky early on in that we, you know, had that sort of uh, funding from that side of the business. Um, the conversations we did have when we thought about raising money earlier were basically exactly what you just said. There was, you know, I don't get it. Like if you're talking to say a VC, you know, what they get when Robin Hood rolls into a VC, however many years ago that was, and it's like, have you heard about payment for order flow? No. Um, well, we can make trading free. It's like, okay, where do I sign up? And it's a very easy pitch. When you're talking about it from, you know, we are going to take this options market and, you know, nudge people into smarter trades so because they have longer lifetime value and, you know, their outcomes will be better over time and things like that. You know, people are looking at you like, oh, that's great. Good luck with that. But that sounds small. And then we've also heard it's really expensive to get new accounts. And we're like, great. Um, now, <laughs> after options have been in the news for the last four or five months, we have people calling us. And it, the, it, the difference is night and day. It's because now those conversations that you and I were just having about you know, I've heard everybody's trading options all of a sudden. And again, like you're seeing all of these new accounts. Um, you know, you go to those places like Wall Street Bets. Like if you had gone there a year ago, everybody's talking about stocks. You go there now, nobody's talking about stocks. It's all options. So you have all these people, you know, coming into the market. They're all trading options. And, you know, again, going back to from a business standpoint, where we're positioning ourselves is, you know, what comes after that? What's next? We know how that ends um, and who's going to be there for the long term. Speaking of that long term there, CC, that music means we've run out of time here on the old Options Insider radio program. Glad you could join us here to give us the perspective of a new entrant to the options brokerage world. Don't get too many of those these days, so it's always fascinating to hear that. But that said, CC, before we go, maybe you want to leave our audience a little bit of a hint a little bit of a tease of what's coming down the pike from you and the team over there at Options AI. Or maybe there's something you forgot to mention you think our audience would really appreciate. Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Oh, absolutely. So we just, in the last week, launched a couple of free tools. And you can go to a couple of sites. One is learn.optionsai.com. And, you know, it's a lot of educational content, video, um, you know, daily market um, articles. But then within there, you can look at the free tools category. And we have a, an earnings calendar that uh, you know, shows you what the expected move of stocks about to report and what they've done as their actual moves the last three times. And there's a tool there where you can take expected moves and compare five stocks and overlay their expected move chart. So some really cool free tools out there that we just released. There we go. And hit it one more time. If folks are intrigued, they want to learn more, maybe they want to follow you on the old Twitter machine or perhaps head on over to the site itself. Obviously, a lot of people still doing desktop right now, stuck at home. Where should they go? What should they do, CC? Yeah, so optionsai.com to learn more. Uh, on Twitter, I am options underscore I, E-Y-E. There you go. Options underscore I on the old Twitter's. Or, of course, uh, Options AI is the place to go. Of course, find them in the App Store as well. Pick up their app and check it out for yourself. And while you're checking things out, make sure you check out the rest of our program. It's not just interviews here. 
on the old network. A whole bunch more in store for your course, Education Wednesday, coming up tomorrow with OPR and Options Boot Camp. Thursday, obviously, taking the day off, so no second episode of the Option Block and no TWIFO this week. We'll see what's going on with Volatility Views on Friday. We'll look into that. We're right back again on Monday with the Option Block all the way through to Tuesday, another episode of Options Insider Radio. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.